Good morning and uh, welcome to the 19th meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Remind everyone to switch off mobile phones, etc., apart from tablets which may be used for work uh, on the committee's business just now. Agenda item one is public petition PE01490. Uh, this first item today is to take evidence in roundtable format on this petition on the control of wild geese numbers. And uh, it has been lodged by Patrick Krauser on behalf of the Scottish Crofting Federation, uh, who is here with us today. I welcome Patrick, Chief Executive of uh, Scottish Crofting Federation, and ask people to go round the table and introduce themselves. Uh, good morning, Patrick. Um, Cara's next. Andrew Bauer from NFU Scotland. Claudia Beamish, South Scotland MSP and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Oostin Robertson, Western Isles Council. I chair the Council's Joint Consultative Committee on Crofting. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSP, Skylar Harbour and Bednoch. Marshall Don, MSP, Angus North and Mearns. Baz Hughes, I'm Head of the Species Conservation Department at the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust at Slimbridge. Ferguson MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. Irina Curran Colthart, uh, Local Biodiversity Officer, Argyll and View Council. Jim Hume, MSP South Scotland. Um, Paul Walton, uh, Head of Habitats and Species for RSPB Scotland. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Uh, Graham the MSP <coughs> for Angus South. And Rob Gibson, MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, and the convener of the committee. Uh, so I refer members to the public papers and uh, I have a sort of a structural proposal to suggest about how we uh, deal with these matters. I think, first of all, we should look at the science uh, of uh, the issue of numbers. Um, secondly, we should look at the methods of control. Thirdly, we should look at markets uh, which have begun. Fourthly, we should think about what the government is doing. And fifthly, we should think about the way ahead. I'll repeat that. So science first, um, methods of control second, markets third, um, government action fourth, and the way forward fifth. I think if we deal with them in those ways, we'll be able to focus better they may overlap. It may be that obviously we need to say things about what the government's doing in relation to some of the previous ones. But if I kick off on the science just now, um, I'd like to put it into the context of um, the African-Eurasian water bird agreement because I think we can't get an idea about numbers and species until we think across Europe and our international agreements to be able to ensure that uh, all species have a fair uh, you know, habitat to live in. So I'd just like to open it up by asking about the different goose species because there are different problems in different areas and there are different problems in different countries. And in order to answer the petition, I don't think it's possible just to deal with things in the narrow context of let's say North, uh, the US or whatever, that we may reach a conclusion that there needs to be a wider uh, solution. But that's roughly where I'm starting. So different goose species, the problem in different areas, the problem in different countries, or the issues in different countries. Does anyone want to kick off in those? Just indicate and then we'll bring you in. Paul, first of all. OK, yeah, th thank you very much. Um, so uh, it can be quite confusing when you look down the list of goose species. I mean, you're exactly right. Um, in essence, in terms of the issues for agriculture here in Scotland, there are really kind of two kinds of geese. The one is the, uh, the breeding resident greylag goose population, um, which, which has increased very markedly over the past few decades which is a legal quarry species, so can be legitimately and legally hunted in the, in the open season and can be shot under licence during the closed season. And the RSPV doesn't have any problem with that. We're not an anti-hunting organisation in, in any way. Um, 
And it's a species for which we have well under 5% of the world's population. So we are not in, in that international context that uh, Rob mentioned there, you know, we're, we're not hugely significant. So that's, that's the breeding grey leg. And that is the species which is the key issue in the crofting areas. So these very high nature value farming areas that we have, almost uniquely high value for biodiversity in areas like the US. The key issue is the breeding grey lag goose. I think it's really important to make the distinction between those and the migratory species, the principal problem one of which is the Greenland and Svalbard barnacle goose. Okay, now for the uh, Greenland barnacle goose, which is one that caused an issue on Isla, we have in Scotland 75% of the world's population. So we are of very considerable international significance for that species. It's a species that's protected under Annex 1 of the Birds Directive, which the Greylag Goose is not. It's not a legal quarry species. Um, and so in conservation terms and biological terms, there's a really important distinction between those two, and I think that's, that's very important. There are other goose species... Um, there are other quarry species like the pink-footed goose, which is m migratory. There's the Greenland white front goose, which is also protected and is declining in number. In terms of barnacle goose numbers, uh, what we've seen is big increases, uh, partly as a conservation success and partly as a result of increasing nitrogen input uh, you know, into farmland since the Second World War. That population has, in, has, has increased markedly. And on Isla has stabilised out since about 2006, statistically. So it, it stabilised at a far higher level in Isla, yeah. for yeah. example. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people want to come in. Graham Day's uh, indicated. Just a sort of scene. Second question. Good morning. Um, roughly, what are the numbers and how reliable is the data? Fire away, yes, Baz. So in terms of, of barnacle goose, um, the data are reliable, so barnacle geese on Isla, because there are both international counts and monthly field counts as well. So the, the data that we have on, on that species is, is very good. Uh, if we move on to the grey lags, we have excellent surveys of grey lags on Orkney, so we know that there are about 20,000 geese on Orkney. Uh, on the Uists, there are some concerns about the counts because the, uh, the numbers that are counted and the productivity don't seem to tie up so there's some more work to be done there on Colin Tyree we've got good data um, so most of the grey lag populations apart from the US we have we have good data as well Does anyone want to comment about the data in the US Christian, uh... well, they have been collecting data in the US for about 30 odd years. The, the US Goose Management Committee have been having two counts for probably over, over 30 years now. Uh, the one thing that was fairly reliable, the, the numbers were rising every year. Crofters would argue that, that the numbers given were, were not as high as they should have been, but the, the, the one thing that was quite clear was that the numbers were going up consistently each year. Um, the barnacle, of course, which was mentioned by Paul earlier on, has become a huge problem in the US now, and a crofter referenced them yesterday to me as being like locusts in a field. So, and there was, uh, you know, they are becoming an increasing problem in the US, but we've had the grey like for 30 odd years, and the one consistent thing is that the numbers have been going up. Uh, Baz, she's... Just to clarify, that the, on the US there are mainly grey lag geese, there are not many barnacle geese at all. Okay. Um, so we're talking about uh, these two main species, and you've heard about the others who are in smaller numbers, um, some in decline. Um, what does the science say then about um, moving on to the methods, particularly, that have been used to try and control them? the methods. Um, you know, I think we need to get uh, some other people into this discussion because you'll know how your farmers and crofters have been acting there. Does anyone want to talk about that? Right, Andrew. Um, if I can speak specifically about Isla, um, you know, there's a long history there of trying to um, minimise the impacts through various scaling techniques um, you know, 
it's what, what are called scary men that pop up in the field and gas guns and you, you name it, it's been tried. I think the, the view certainly of our farming members on Isla is that um, they're willing to give these a go, but what they find is the geese become habituated to them and their effectiveness declines over time. It has been said in the past that, um, you know, in terms of methods, uh, money is a satisfactory method for dealing with the problem. Uh, if you'd spoken to our members on Isla 10, 20 years ago, they would probably have accepted that, yeah, maybe grudgingly, but they did. Uh, they've now come to the realisation that money really just stores up problems for later on because as the geese have grown, the budgets have declined and now there isn't, there isn't sufficient budget to uh, compensate for the impacts that are being had and moreover they now feel we're actually not even able to farm in some instances we're effectively farming to feed the geese and we have very little else that comes off the land and from their point of view in terms of methods money is no longer you know an acceptable method there they, they feel that things really have to move on to a different phase now okay yes um, marina in, in following on from Isla, you, you mentioned there the, the compensation. Um, certainly in terms of the landscape of Isla, I, I think certainly the farming and crofting community have a, a very major contribution to it. And uh, from, from what I have uh, gleaned and researched, there's certainly um, a will to change management um, ob uh, objectives to create a balanced approach to farming on Isla, make it more sustainable and also crofting. And I think uh, with maintaining, the, trying to get that balance, I think there has to be a bit of tweaking both on the farming side in terms of land management and on the goose management side as well. Okay. Uh, Patrick, yes. Um, I think and the feeling that I get from, from crofters and, and from discussions within our organisation is that it's not really working what's being done. And, and so whilst we don't necessarily have all the answers, well, we probably don't have answers as such at all, really, I think it's important that we recognise that the numbers are just going up and up, which is why, why we launched the petition. Um, I thought it was... A very good point that was brought up in, in evidence that we should be looking at how people are dealing with um, goose control in other countries. And there was the example of, of the Norwegian project. And uh, it's something that we have been thinking about because there's this, there's, there's a, you know, some people are, are complaining about the fact that there's this public money going in constantly to a national goose management program that's been running for years and years and yet the numbers just keep going up and up and from our point of view for, as a community group we would argue that that perhaps um, the main successes from past programs the the prime success being the maca life project has been a program that involves the the local people and so external sort of top-down interventions just don't seem seem to work and and the only way that, that they would work is if you had a massive coal program that's going to cost huge amounts of money and I don't think anyone wants to go there so 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 planning a, a management scheme that is going to be sustainable. I think that's the point. And the only way it's going to be sustainable is to use the people that are there on the ground that, that know what the problem is and um, know the issues involved with, with control of geese in these local situations. Okay. Um, Dave Thompson. Yeah, thanks, convener. <coughs> um, just arising from what's been said uh, already this morning in terms of, I mean, uh, there's obviously a, a real issue and a real problem. And, you know, it would be nice to think we could get a solution that would be Scotland-wide and it would deal with the problem and that would be it. But already we've heard from bars about the, the lots of Greylag and, and, and the US and Western Isles, uh, the barnacles and Isley. Greylag are a quarry species. The barnacles are protected. <clears throat> so you, you, 
strikes me you, you, you can't apply the same solution, obviously, to those two different things. And we, if we've got 75% of the world's population of barnacle, I think Buzz said, uh, and a lot of them on Islay, then obviously, you know, that creates a particular issue and a particular problem. Um, and I just wonder uh, about the, the methods of control. We, we may well just have to have different methods of dealing with it in different parts. And it, it strikes me, as a layman, uh, that a surfeit of grey lag, which are a quarry species, um, looks to me like a really good food source that should be utilised for the benefit of everyone. Um, therefore, why aren't we applying a solution in relation to grey lag which would allow them to be shot and then marketed? And I know there's the rules and regulations that prevent that at the moment, but it strikes me that that's a bit daft. And they could either be sold for human consumption or they could be turned into animal feed or something like that. OK, there's the issue of recreating markets and so on, but I'm sure, again, we could you know, deal with that. And I just wonder if that isn't the pretty obvious answer to the grey lab problem. The barnacle problem is a different one, um, which I think maybe we could look at separately. We may get some comments first on the grey lag issue and the fact that we should be able to let people um, shoot them and sell them. Been into the marketing area, but yes, um, we will most certainly do that. Uh, Baz wanted to come in, and uh, Graham Day and Alec Ferguson, and a point I'm going to make, and Ustin, right in that order. So, Baz Hughes first. I was actually going to make the clarification that Dave just did, just to remind people that we are talking about two different, completely different situations with grey lags and barnacle geese. I think we're all in agreement that the grey lag populations that are increasing in the crofting areas and potentially affecting the high nature value farming areas are a problem and that's why SNH have introduced their adaptive management pilots. In those pilots, again, people will know from the papers that there are trials of, of sales and uh, while we, we are cautious about those sales, if they're properly licensed and properly managed, then they seem to be working reasonably well, certainly on Orkney. Um, I think if that sale was then to be applied to other more common <coughs> excuse me, and migrant goose populations, <coughs> like pink-footed goose, then th there is a danger of create, creating a large market, um, admittedly from a large goose popula population at the moment, but those sort of um, commercial wide harvesting activities are the reasons why many of our goose populations went down to such low levels 30 or 40 years ago. So we would not be opposing these trials of sales of geese in the crofting areas, but we would have a very different position if that, that model was to be applied to the more common goose species, um, even, with, even if it was regulated. Graham Day. Yeah, I'm a, like Dave Thompson, I'm very much a layman in this, but I, don't, I wonder if we shouldn't be trying to think out of the box here, and this really isn't it, uh, out of the box suggestion. But um, on the east coast of Scotland, we have a considerable problem with seagulls. And we were looking at solutions to this. We looked at the situation in Venice with the pigeons, where they controlled the numbers by lacing feed with contraceptives. And I just wonder, when we're talking about Orkney with 20,000 grey lag geese, which presumably that's the dominant species, whether you can combine trying something like that with a shooting programme. So it's, it's a bit of a left field, but it's just a thought. Well, we can certainly bring people in with that thought. Uh, Alec Ferguson. Um, I was interested when Andrew Bauer said that the, his members on, on um, Islay uh, felt that they think this needed to move to a new phase, I think was the description you used, and I just wondered whether you might just be able to expand on whether they have a combined view of what that new phase should be, if that's appropriate, convenient. Well, okay. um, we're at a sensitive phase in the discussions about this, so I won't, uh, you know, I'll try and not uh, open Pandora's box here, but this document, which is the Isle of Sustainable Goose Management Strategy, is currently in draft form. That's been developed by our local members, SNH and Scottish Government, and we believe sets out the way forward for a more sustainable strategy over the next 10 years at least. Uh, it acknowledges 
that there are protected species here that are being talked about, and it does talk about combining methods, but it also sets a target population and a well, it sets a range, a sustainable range, and um, the and a, and a program of monitoring and evaluation on things like agricultural damage, because that's a key consideration here. And we, you know, we are very supportive of this. We um, believe SNH and Scottish Government have matured in their understanding of the issues and accepted that there's a problem here that needs to be dealt with, but it needs to be dealt with in a, a legally robust um, way. Um, but we are hopeful that in the near future this document will be approved, it will go and, and we'll start seeing real change there on Isla. But it's not going to be an overnight fix there. This is, this is, they are protected species. We need to be comfortable that we're within the bounds of the law, but without getting ourselves tied in knots about being 100% sure on every single last little detail, because if we wait to that point, or even close to that point, we'll be here in 10 years' time. That's the key risk, is that we, we hang around and wait for every single last bit of data to be perfect, and therefore in action, and uh, uh, the status quo remains. Uh, Oostin wanted to come and in. The pilot scheme at the moment in Newest where um, you are allowed to sell the geese, uh, goose meat, um, the people shooting the geese have to be licensed, of course, and they have to have done uh, hygiene training. Uh, the people, the premise is selling, it has to be licensed, but they're only allowed to be sold and used itself, and of course demand is absolutely huge for it. The, the uh, thing we would like to see is, is them it's kind of open sale them to be allowed to say, sell them off island which we're not allowed to do at the moment um, clearly cartridges things like that shot very very expensive so um, there's some return to those taking part if we have that so there's definitely potential there indeed um, the issue about marketing and so on is something we will yeah. bring you back in on and Dave as well if it's on that point but uh, Paul was still talking about the science here I think just now and uh, the methods um, what, what, what I really wanted to um, refer to was what Dave Thompson said, said there which is um, uh, this idea of, of kind of locally appropriate solutions kind of evolving that's exactly what's been happening since the 1990s. We have had, as someone referred to, um, local goose management, seven local goose management schemes in total running throughout Scotland with Scottish Government um, support and funding, Secretariat often by SNH, but each one has been different. So the US one was different, very different from the Isla one, etc. And the one in Strathbeg in the northeast with pink footed geese was very, very different as well. And so that's exactly the way it was. The reason we are here is because uh, Scottish ministers took a decision to cut the budget for goose management. And um, when that happened, that. Uh, when that happened, you know, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't for, it wasn't for spurious reasons. This was post the, the financial crisis 2008-2009, uh, when constraints were exceedingly tight on, on ministers. And this is one of the things that ministers had a look at and decided that the, the, the amount that they spent on, on goose management had to change and cuts were made to budgets and then things started to fall apart. A situation that had very carefully evolved as a balance between um, the agricultural interests and agricultural damage and the conservation interests and getting value for the public purse, which were the three main aims of goose policy in Scotland. And at the moment, it's quite interesting seeing these debates because these are debates which have been running for quite a long time. It's just that with the turnover of officials, people can't quite um, remember. Um, but, but, but I think that's a very, very important point. That it is really, it's a complex issue, but it really requires locally adapted solutions. Thank you, Camino. And I just can I follow that up because in, in the RSPB submission to us, written submission, um, you, you are very clear in saying that the um, science in relation to all this is not sufficiently robust. So if one is to have effective local management schemes, presumably you would argue there needs to be more robust science behind it. How, I mean, do you have any suggestions how one can increase the quality of the scientific evidence behind these schemes, given the constraints on budgets that exist? Um, so uh, apologies for, 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 again, sort of um, being fairly 
fairly strong on this point, but it depends on, on the different situations. So for the, for the grey lacks, okay, in, um, in, in Orkney, um, for example, um, there's a lot of hunting goes on in Orkney, sport mm -hmm. hunting. Um, but in Scotland, the gathering of data on hunting bags is exceedingly poor in relation to other uh, European countries and, and beyond in America and places like that. We have no idea how many geese are being shot by people who are coming from Italy, etc., you know, on sporting hunting visit, visit this country. And that is something which we would argue really ought to be addressed. And during the Wayne Act, there was discussion around this matter. There was exploration of, of, of um, a system of voluntary bag recording. There has been no science around how accurate that actually is. And it would suggest if you're going to go for this adaptive management approach, a scientifically underpinned um, you know, managing populations to certain preordained levels, you really need to know that additional mortality. So that's one example. Uh, with the barnacle goose on Isla, there's another huge um, gap in our knowledge in terms of what's the efficacy of lethal versus non-lethal scaring. Now, that might seem, you know, to, to a farmer who's supporting thousands of geese, you tell him he's got 75% of the world population, he, doesn't he or she doesn't necessarily mind. That's not the first thing in, in, in their mind. But there's a legal question here under the European Birds Directive, which is around the idea of, um, of a, a viable alternative solution. Okay? And unless we understand what lethal scaring can give you by, by shooting the birds and what non-lethal scaring can do, in terms of agricultural damage, then you really don't have the basic picture. And we have been calling for this for 15 years, and the research hasn't been done. Right, that's uh, into the plot. You mentioned Dave Thompson. I will let him come back just now before I, you know, develop um, Claudia and uh, Nigel and Andrew. Yeah, well, back. thank you, uh, convener. Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm aware that the, the various um, different schemes have been running for a number of years and that there are pilots and all the rest of it. What I was trying to get at, and probably put it very badly, is that... Um, we haven't got very far, and I don't think it's just purely down to government cutting cash, um, because you could keep on throwing cash at it in an ever-growing way, as I think Andrew Bauer was suggesting in relation to Eile, and what are you actually achieving at the end of the day? The, the, the point that Ushton Robertson made about allowing the, 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 the geese to be sold off the island, I mean, what I'm really saying, I suppose, is have we not done enough in terms of the pilot, certainly in relation to, say, U.S. and so on, to actually then move this out and, and broaden out the ability to, to sell uh, geese, not just restrict it to U.S., for instance? Um, and we could go on forever pulling together data, and, and Dr. Paul Walton says we don't have nearly enough and we should have been doing it 15 years ago or whatever, but we're in a situation just now where there's a real problem. I think there's probably enough evidence. And I don't think you need to wait, as Andrew Bauer said, uh, to get every last I dotted and T crossed in terms of your data before you can make decisions. Um, because decisions have already been made in the past with even less uh, data than we have just now. So it just strikes me that a very simple and straightforward solution would be to um, broaden the, 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 the pilots and use, allow the geese to be sold so we can begin to create a market. Why do we need to wait that much longer, you know, in order to do this? So if people have answers to that, I would welcome uh, hearing their views on that. And to broaden it again, um, you'll get in a wee minute. Claudia Beamish and Nigel Don. Thank you, convener. I, I did, I'm, I'm glad that this... Um, aspect of it, the local um, goose management schemes has been raised uh, because it, initially, uh, as, a, as indeed a layperson myself, of course, it does seem to be an interesting way forward. And I hope, convener, that when we come to the, the point about the um, Scottish Government that we will be able to discuss if there are funding implications for this, but I'll hold back on that part of it until we come to Scottish Government. But there were two uh, quick points I wanted to put in um, about... Uh, the issue of um, lead shot, if we're talking about management, and um, its use or not use, uh, and what the alternative is if we're talking about um, actual culls, and also 
the issue around tourism, which has been highlighted to me in relation to Isla, uh, as, uh, and, and I'm not advocating that um, that, that is, is something that is necessarily the, a way forward, but there are issues around an interest in tourists seeing um, the geese flying, which is a very dramatic sight, obviously, so I'm just putting those things in. They wouldn't know the difference between 5,000 and 10,000, though. Um, <coughs> anyway, um, Nigel, Don? Simply, um, Alex Ferguson went in the direction that I was actually going to go about the science, but I'm just wondering back if, wondering if I can come back to Paul Walton um, on, on a couple of thoughts. The, the first, and I think I'm, I'm with uh, Dave Thompson on this, you, you, you never get complete data. That's the, the obvious lesson of life, and that you just have to work with what you've got and always try and explore what you need. Um, if I heard Dr. Walton right, he suggested that a few years ago the balance was about to write. And I'm not trying to over-egg this. Um, but I think you also then said, we don't have enough science, so we don't know. Uh, and I'm just a bit confused as to how those two tie together. But I guess my real question is, what do we need to do to improve the science without spending megabucks, because we know it's not there? Can somebody put some priority on actually where we, should be, where we need to do the science? Please. Okay, we well, we'll get a chance to come in in a minute, because Andrew Bauer could perhaps, uh, in his response, also uh, tell me a bit about... Uh, the fouling of the soil, which farmers are most concerned about uh, with the large numbers that we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, just to pick up on Dave's point from earlier on about the markets, you know, that may well be um, part of the solution. Certainly we found in Orkney, part of the problem there is there are so many geese that when you scare them off one part of the island, you might get a shot, you might cull a few, they move to the offshore islands and they stay there, it's more difficult and costly to deal with them thereafter. So. There are logistical and, and uh, problems now. You could put more money into it, and that might solve them. But uh, I, I would, I would doubt it. Um, the the situation on Isla, uh, we, we Paul talked about balance a few. You know, we were in balance a few years ago. I think that money had, in effect, bought people silence. And bought their, you know, their their kind of acceptance of of, of uh, problem to a certain level. That's now we're now in a completely different sphere. The population may have stabilised, but it's stabilised at a level that's unsustainable. And we really need to be taking action now. And we, we you know, imperfect data needs to be improved on. There's plans on Isla because of this project to establish 26, I think it is, exclosures, so plots where geese are kept out. How would you? Uh, how could we practically help at the moment? I know I've just said that money's not the solution, but the farmers for whom those exclosures are going to have a practical impact on their farm may find it easier, more acceptable uh, to get on board with uh, a really substantial uh, bit of monitoring on agricultural damage if there's help with the impacts on their farm because of those exclosures, because of the way Isla farming operates those 26 exclosures, it's going to be difficult to find the land to put them on with the right type of crop in the right rotation. So it, this is a, you know, a short-term problem. More money there might help, but we, don't, you know, we know that overall money is not necessarily going to sort the problems. Um, th this, this will deliver more science. It won't deliver perfect science. It won't deliver perfect data. But absolutely, I would agree with Nigel Dodd. You need to proceed on the basis of the best available evidence that you've got and improve as you go along. We can't stand still right now. Okay. Paul Walton and the Marina Karen Coulter. Okay, so uh, I mean, that's uh, oh, just coming. There you go. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, so the suggestion seems to be that I'm somehow being, um, you know, excessively pedantic in order to kind of delay, d delay things, uh, and, and dotting every I and crossing every T. Well, the current um, ILA plan that Andrew showed there, um, this relates, I say again, to a migratory species, all right? There has been no approach to the other countries where this species occurs, Greenland and Iceland, Okay, in terms of what do you think about us halving the population of these geese, which is one of the potential, was in the range that Andrew talked about. That's not a detail. That's pretty fundamental. We haven't actually measured agricultural damage 
and what impact these measures might have on agricultural damage. That is the whole point of these goose schemes. I would say that that isn't a detail or dotting an I. There's some pretty fundamental gaps, and I think that's quite a long way to go. Now, we are part of the discussions, okay? The, the uh, mention of the Norway scheme for pink-footed geese, which I remind you is actually a quarry species, unlike the, the barnacle goose and can be legally hunted. The thing that sets that uh, example apart is that all parties were engaged right from the start in devising how that scheme came about. Conservationists, hunters and farmers. Um, here, it hasn't really been the same with regard to the Isla one. It has been the Scottish Government and SNH officials and the NFUS visiting the European Commission together uh, and, and hatching this, this plan and then putting it down in front of us when there are clear gaps in the, gaps in the knowledge. And I, and I stand by what I say. I think these, the, these gaps in the knowledge are quite important. So, does that answer your questions, Nigel Don, about the, the science that we need to uh, gain knowledge of? Well, I don't think it answers it completely, but I think... I, I think Dr. Paul Walton's made the, the point that there are large gaps in, in the data which ought to be there to, to model this properly. I, I think that's a fair comment. Uh, Marina and then Baz. In, in terms of um, farm management, um, obviously there are certain farming interests on, on Isla particularly, and uh, they're in a research, their research models. And uh, they've been very successful in terms of encouraging geese. Um, I've been looking at some of the opportunities that are there in terms of legal uh, derogation, particularly under the Article 9 EC um, Birds Directive, there to um, allow a certain amount of um, uh, geese to be shot to prevent serious damage to crops, livestock, forest, fisheries, water, agriculture and crofting that are affected. So in terms of maybe a short-term solution to get things back on an even keel would certainly be worth considering at a government level. The other interest I want to uh, discuss is the tourism aspect. Uh, Claudia Beamish referred to it. Um, in terms of Isla in general, people just don't go to Isla to see the, the wildlife, although it's wonderful biodiversity. We have some of the best examples in Britain, in Argyll and Butte. And, um, they also want to get the flavour of the culture of the island as well, and it's dominated by farming and crofting. And, and that, again, has to be re rebalanced because fields look different when they have been um, eaten down by uh, the variety of geese that exist there. So to get that balance back on track, I think, there are certain, there's modelling to be done, but also there's a legal aspect that can be engineered to, to suit, but even on a short-term basis, to, to get it back on an even kilter. Yeah, uh, three things. Uh, the first one is that, that in terms of science needs for barnacle geese, um, there are legal implications as well because obviously you need to try non-lethal solutions before you can actually legally get a derogation under the birds directive and there may well be scientific evidence needed, which is what Paul has just said, to allow that process to be legal. And obviously those birds, there has been birds being killed, so there are questions at the moment about whether the current culling is actually legal for barnacle geese. Um, another science gap is evidence of, of economic damage uh, and economic impact on farmers. <clears throat> so, after visiting the Isla and, and knowing the people up there, um, it is clear that, that the, the level of payments that the farmers are getting uh, aren't as high as, as calculated by the model used by SNH. Um, and also, the, the, the figures that are used, I think, haven't been updated since, um, since, since 2008, so there may well be an issue. But my main issue there is we've not seen the evidence of economic impact on farmers when it probably exists. The only study that's been done by Bevan in 2012 had case studies of three farmers, two of which were being undercompensated by 17 and 21,000 pounds a year, one just by 1,000. But there are 100 farmers on Isla. So I think the best thing that could be done is some sort of economic analysis to, so we've got all of our cards on the table and we all know whether what is being said is, is, is true. Um, and that would, that would help. And the, and the final point I'd like to make is that um, the science for the barnacle goose is very complicated uh, and there is a, a lot more needed and, and we would be very happy to table a paper on this if that would help. But the science required 
um, to fix the adaptive management grey lag pilots in the areas that Dave's mentioning, they are easily fixed. There's a few minor tweaks that are needed for a few tens of thousands of pounds, and, and that, that could be fixed very easily. So those, the, the grey lag situation can be fixed easily. It's a barnacle goose situation that is a lot more complicated. OK, well, Andrew Bauer, Paul Walton, and Ustin Robertson. Andrew. Clarification there, um, Baz mentioned about you know getting a derogation. Um, we can choose as a country to derogate. The Scottish Government can choose if it decides that it's confident in what it's doing, it derogates from the Birds Directive. The, the legal challenge from the European Commission or the, the calling in of that decision would happen if somebody complained about it. And the obvious groups that might would be RSPB or WWT who would object to what was being done. So, you know, it's not a matter that this is something that has to be approved by the European Commission. We've sat down with them. They've said this is something that Scotland needs to sort out itself. We are not sitting here doing the big brother thing. You get on and you sort it out. If there's a major problem, yes, we might look at it, but we might not. So we, we, we mustn't get paranoid about the idea of applying for a derogation. Yes, we need good science. Yes, we need to improve things as we go along. But uh, it, this, the, the solution is in our hands. So I think that's very important that we bear that in mind. Okay. Uh, Alton? Uh, yeah, I mean, in relation to that, I'll just remind everyone that um, the uh, precedent that is set tends to be quite important. The Birds Directive is uh, one of the most effective pieces of conservation legislation in human history. It is measurable, demonstrable. It's had a massive impact on those Annex 1 species, and it's been positive. Um, uh, if Scotland decided to, you know, set about halving its 75% of the world population of that species, I think it's quite likely that it would actually attract some, some, some scrutiny, although uh, Andrew's quite right, you can't say for, can't say for sure. But the, 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 kind of the point I'd like to make is that there seems to be a flavour around this discussion that basically Scotland is full of people chomping at the bit to, to get out, to shoot these geese and solve the problem. But there is quite a big issue around this, which is the actual feasibility of doing that. It is not easy. I think Andrew actually alluded to this. That, you know, in order, it's not actually easy to shoot very large numbers of geese. The minister, a couple of years back, doubled the bag limit on Isla because there are barnacle geese shot under licence on Isla, um, which we uh, do not agree with, but we haven't pursued that opposition. But when that, that doubled, we got, the RSPB got complaints from visitors to Isla saying that the shooting itself was more visible. They may not notice the difference between 10,000 and 5,000 geese, as the convener said, but they do see the shooting. And if we're going to really increase that further, it's going to be pretty obvious because it's going to be difficult to do and there are going to be a lot of people out there. So the whole business of adaptive management, i.e. controlling the population, actively controlling the population, which shouldn't be confused with the previous schemes. This is an idea that's been trialled for grey lags for the past couple of years in Orkney. But, but the, the idea of doing that is entirely untested. And what I would just like to say to get back to the actual, what I think is the spirit of the petition, which is about the crofting areas uh, in US, is that the Macher Life Scheme, which has been mentioned before, which the RSPB was really uh, very, very integral to getting off the ground, and, and operationally was kind of running it as well. It took over the US goose scheme with a view to seeing that cuts were going to be made in that budget. And with the application, we think at minimum of, of about 80,000, 75, 80,000 pounds a year, the crops on US were effectively protected. The total area of late harvested arable crops on US, which delivered a huge biodiversity value, has increased under that project. And the number of crofter complaints went down to zero. And the number of geese shot under license actually decreased. And we used non-lethal scaring methods. We had children building scarecrows, etc. A goose plucking machine was bought by the project, etc. We're trying to build that locally sustainable industry. And the RSPB has been really involved in that and is, and is supportive of that sort of thing. Christian Robertson. Yes, in, in terms of evidence, we've and I've lived with this over the last 30, 40 years in use. We've seen the damage Geese has done over that period. Crofting practices have changed, you know, uh, to, to move with the problem that exists. And uh, uh, 
certain areas have been given up to the geese, basically, because they can't be protected. And, and to be fair to Paul, the, the scheme, the EU Life Macher programme did work because there was a heavy emphasis on crop protection, which is the big issue in ewes. There's a, you know, it's, there's a fair income come in, comes into ewes on the back of the work that's done on the Macher. Uh, but the worry now is at the end of the project, what's going to happen next? Um, but the evidence is there when the protection isn't there on what can happen to the crops in use. Crofters just give up. And, and I've been told quite clearly in the last few days that, that that's what they're going to do. They're not going to keep putting in hours and hours of work and time to protect the crops for no return. When the geese have been through it, it's like our road rollers went through it. OK, um, Andrew Bauer, we're going to try and, uh, you know, we've looked at this science and, uh, you know, methods issue. I'm trying to draw that section to a close so that we can look at uh, some of the others that arise. Just, just a quick point in there, um, you know, NFU Scotland, our members on Isla, our members in Orkney, our members in all these affected areas understand that they have, and Scotland has, legal obligations that these birds are here to stay. We are not calling for the eradication of these species. We are calling for a more sustainable number. And I think there's a question in here about people's right to farm. Um, yes, they have wider obligations. They receive direct support. And with that comes obligations to deliver public goods. But at the same time, I think it's only fair that they be able to run their business in the most sustainable way that they can and they be able to produce food, which is primarily what they're there to do. And for some of them, particularly in places like Isla, that's becoming almost impossible. So. Hey, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, Convener. Just a quick question um, to Councillor Robertson. Um, can you give us a, a, an update on exactly where uh, the funding situation is for the Macha Life project? Is, is there the prospect of it continuing or not? No, I don't think so. Maybe Paul can answer that, but no. Uh, yeah, yes, I can answer that. Um, so it was a four-year project, um, and it didn't just look at geese. It did, it did lots of other things as well. You know, um, machinery needed for spreading traditional seaweed, fertiliser, etc., etc. Um, it has just ended. Okay, we did. We we were keen the, to to uh, do a second life-funded project, EU-funded project, which the European Commission tells us is quite normal for that sort of project. However, the uh, SNH were unable to assist with the co-financing, which would have been essential to do it, and it didn't work financially. So we're left with this situation. Um, what we did then was we, we went to um, SNH and said, look, OK, you're going to this adaptive management <coughs> for, the, for the geese on UIST, which is managing the population down, but that is untested, and it is not actually the active crop protection, which is those precious small areas, globally unique arable macker. Okay. Um, and we figured out that it would cost seventy-five to eighty thousand pounds a year just to do a bit of crop protection. SNH very generously uh, found forty thousand pounds to fund that. What would be extremely useful and positive output of this discussion would be if we managed to get the extra just to make a full crop protection scheme for the next few years until we can see whether adaptive management population regulation actually does work in terms of protecting, uh, protecting those crops. Uh, and that, which I, I think, considering this is, a, this is, I say again, a globally unique biodiversity resource that is based on the, the extensive cattle crofting system of the U.S., there are 35 unique races of small oats, rye and barley on the U.S. alone that will be lost if people switch to mainland varieties. For a few tens of thousands of pounds, we can really protect that, and I think that would be good value for money. I, I put that to the committee. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. That's maybe a point we can raise with the Minister. Yeah, indeed, that's the point of this, gathering evidence so that we can uh, uh, quiz the government. Um, Baz and uh, Patrick, just to sort of wrap up this kind of section before we move on to markets. Just at the, the information gap that Andrew's just highlighted there, that, that he mentions that, the, that there are many um, farmers on Isla or Orkney that are, are really uh, on, uh, on the wire, basically, so they might be being put out of business by geese. Let's see the evidence. Let's, let's collect the evidence and see that and see what proportion of farmers are in that situation because I think we need that information to put whatever level of goose control might be discussed into context. Um, 
there are questions in my mind about what crops they're trying to grow, whether they're trying to grow for the local industry, uh, stuff like that, you know, which I don't know the details of, but I guess it could become very uh, technical indeed. But we can probably follow these things up after the committee. Um, Patrick, you wanted to come in just now. Just, just a quick one. It's a clarification, really. <coughs> I, I just wanted to say, you know, that the petition that we that we put forward was specifically to look at the crofting areas. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Isla has few crofts and lots of barnacles, and the US has lots of crofts and few barnacles, but, but on the US, people are saying that the barnacles are starting to become more of a problem. But the point is that it's the grey legs that are the serious problem. These are the residents as we've gone on, on and on. So it was just a point of clarification, really. I just wanted to ask Baz, because Baz a minute ago said it's the answer to, to controlling the grey legs is very easy. And I was Sorry, it's not me to ask another person giving evidence, but if you don't mind, if, if, he, if he, he could clarify that. Yep. Thanks. Is it easy? So, <clears throat> as we've been pointing out all the way through, the barnacle situation is very different to the grey leg situation. Um, obviously, the, the, the barnacle geese are causing problems for farmers on Isla. I don't know how many farmers on, on Isla. Um, I, maybe some of them, quite a lot of them, are very happy with the payments that they get. It may well be a small number of farmers who are getting paid quite a lot of money for having geese on their land. I, I don't know, but again, that's why we need more information. With the grey lags, um, the pilots are largely working well. Um, the, the Orkney pilot, um, the numbers of birds that were shot this current season has exceeded the target of 5,500. It was 5,900. It's been properly monitored in terms of numbers, so we know, because we do the surveys every summer, exactly how many birds are there. With a little bit more information in terms of the, the bag, in terms of the, the age ratios in the bag, I think we would have a, a largely fit-for-purpose monitoring scheme on, on Orkney. Um, the other pilots are moving in a similar direction, and the pilot that was just proposed for Lewis and, and Harris uh, it was an excellent proposal that came to NGMRG. So those, those schemes are working very well. Um, the complications arise when we're shifting the discussion away from your original petition to, to ILA. But, you know, we are all trying to find ways in which we can get a steer from the government about how it's going to handle all these local situations. So the petition's a means to an end, not just for people in the US, but... Uh, in other places too, so we've got to take that into account. Um, we're moving really onto the issue about markets, which Jim was going to say some yeah, things about yeah, just yeah. now. Thanks. Thanks very much, convener. And, and just to say, I mean, it's, it's not just a, a problem for the Crofting areas and down in southwest Solway and Sunny Parts. There's, there's problems there with uh, most of the varieties we're talking we're talking about, as Alex Ferguson and Claudia will, will know too. Uh, yeah, just going on to markets, it's been briefly touched on already, but um, every threat there may be an opportunity, in, and we've talked about sport hunting and wild fowling um, as an opportunity. Uh, is that opportunity being uh, explored enough? Are there any barriers at the moment? Are we actually having a, a, perhaps a situation that may be similar with deer, where uh, the, the hunting of, or wild fowling is maybe... Uh, restricted to those with the largest purse who are maybe being encouraged to shoot a couple and, and, and that's it? Or are, are we using that as perhaps or missing an opportunity uh, with that to uh, to actually control them in, in a controlled way? F fair enough what Andrew Bower sort of mentioned about have uh, you shoot a couple uh, and then if you're a good shot, and then they, they disappear to the next island. But if you had somebody uh, on the next island or, or you know, in, in a certain position, you could you could control that that better. So it'd be interesting to see if that's been explored enough uh, and what the barriers are to uh, that not happening at, at, at the moment. Uh, also, just exploring uh, uses off uh, the goose as a as a product one once shot. Obviously, um, I know there's been some small programmes, but every missing opportunities uh, regarding using it as a, a food for humans uh, and also perhaps a food for other uh, things like you know fish meal for feeding fish I should say thanks okay who wants to kick off on that one it's Andrew Bauer certainly Orkney would be the, you know the example that I would look to because that's where you have you know very large 
population of grey lag geese and, and they already have the pilot for the sale. Um, it will help, um, I think, if you were able to free up new markets, that would help even more because at the moment they're restricted to the on-island market. Um, you're expecting people to go out there. there. There may be some modest support available to them for shot and things like that, but the limit on how many you can shoot is the, is the people's goodwill, their time, the cost to them. Therefore, if you're creating new markets and they know that there's going to be somewhere that they can sell, then they're obviously more inclined to go out there and do more shooting. And that will be the challenge, particularly in Orkney, is to find enough people willing to do enough shooting to bring the numbers down from the very, very high levels that they're at at the moment. Interesting to see this, what you mean by that. And also, somebody else mentioned before about uh, specified Italian shooters. I know they're very keen on uh, shooting wildfowl. So, I mean, it's, it's not just a case of finding people perhaps in Orkney to shoot them, but, you know, we encourage people to visit Orkney as part of a, a shooting experience, for example. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there's already a lot of um, groups coming from places like Italy to Orkney. That brings with it its own challenges because obviously they want geese there on tap and if you've had somebody in doing some shooting prior to that for the purposes of control, then they might not get the experience that they're looking for. Our view, I think, would be that you, you need to try and find a balance perhaps with more emphasis on the, the control of numbers. What I mean by freeing up is that you need to open up the mainland market. There are very strict conditions at the moment on what can be done. We're not suggesting that you should remove it and turn it into a free-for-all. But if these people were able to sell into the mainland Scotland and UK markets, then suddenly there would be a completely different um, nature to this. Yes, through the convener, who you were talking about strict conditions. Well, could you explain what these strict conditions are and who, who are imposing I, I these? I think the councillor was describing them earlier yeah. on. It's about how you know the, the data that's collected, who's doing the shooting, where these birds are being processed, how they're being sold, where they're being sold. So a lot of that would remain in place. But I think the key thing would be to say, well, you can you, you can sell rather than being able to sell through the butcher and cut wall or something like that. Suddenly you can sell into the fine establishments of Edinburgh or Glasgow or London or wherever else it might be and suddenly you know there is a demand there and people will obviously put more time and effort into uh, the shooting on Orkney. Um, uh, Baz, Paul and then Ustin. So you can see that if, if, <clears throat> if that was to happen then there would be a demand for goose meat of course there would and that's where you start getting into possible population level uh, impacts. But I was just going to make a related point following up from what Claudia said. We need to be mindful that some of these birds are being shot with lead. And there are human health concerns as well as wildlife health concerns around lead. The Food Standards uh, Agency did offer uh, or issue some advice based on a study in Scotland just a couple of years ago, which basically said that uh, um, groups that consume a lot of game um, are, are at risk uh, of, of human health effects. Um, so particularly groups that were included were pregnant women, children, and people who eat a lot of game, basically. Um, the lead ammunition group is due to report within the next couple of months in terms of the wildlife health and the human health risk assessment. So there wouldn't be an issue here in terms of markets if, if, all, if all of these birds were being shoot, with, shot with non-lead or non-toxic shot, but some, some aren't. Yeah. The geese would be above uh, grass, uh, water, but it is illegal to use lead uh, over water Waters. at the moment anyway, so, yeah. Uh, Paul Walton. And do yes, uh, th thank you, Kavir. Um, um First point I'd like to make about with, with regard to, um, you know, hunting and shooting is that, you know, are just again to reiterate that we are really not good at collecting data on how many birds are being shot in this country. I think the committee should, I'd urge the committee to, to cons consider that. Um, with regard to also seeing these goose populations, oh, there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, the, the Solway barnacle goose population, they're ones that are completely separate from the Isle ones, they breed in Svalbard, not Greenland. Um, um, that population post-war was down to 500 individual birds. And that, for a goose, the goose population go up and down quite naturally. Um, that's the edge of extinction, and that's because of commercial hunting. So uh, I would suggest that um, a too gung-ho attitude to opening up um, sale of carcass would be, would be wrong. At the same time, the idea of geese being shot and it simply being wasted... 
uh, I personally find quite abhorrent. Actually, I think uh, uh, I think something ought to be done about it. But the key point here is that we really have to do it quite carefully and in a controlled manner. And that is why the current pilots that are piloting the sale of goose carcasses, the US and Orkney, um, we're fine with that. But we want to see if the, the, the regulation of it that SNH has put in place, which we've, we, we agree with, is actually effective before we open up to a situation where demand may drive the number of geese that are culled rather than any science that we do. And I think that's a real danger. Around the world, there's been instances where that's happened. So before we make it fully commercial, I think we need to, we need to just tread quite carefully and in a kind of way that we test things and we get the right uh, data, and particularly the right data from, from, uh, from hunting bags. Mm -hmm. Bruce Please. Back to the license issue, I mean specific licenses are issued to the people that are shooting as well as the premises. So the people that are shooting have to have the license and they have to have done the kind of uh, hygiene training as well. Uh, licenses can be issued to others but they can only kind of give them away. Or, and they also have to use a special shot if they're being sold to these premises, they can't use the lead shot. Um, it's been very successful in U.S. since it started. Of course, uh, one of the companies in U.S., McLean's, who have a bakery in Butchery, are talking of extending on the back of the su success of it. I mean, but to go back to Paul's point earlier on, it's, it's very difficult to get that number of people that will have an effect on the numbers. But clearly, already this year, a number of crofters are applying for the license. A number of them are concerned, obviously, about having to do this course on, on hygiene. But uh, I think the ones that have done it have, have, have quite enjoyed it. It's not been as onerous, I think, they thought, thought. So there is potential there to expand the economy of U.S. But there's a demand from outside, too, being given to, to this company. So if we could extend it outside the U.S., it would be a big help. So, um, Claudia, Dave, <coughs> Paul, and uh, back to Jim. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's just a, a quick question. Is there any concern about, um, in relation to shooting, uh, with mixed flocks, if, if they are grazing together? I'm sure we'll get an answer to that as we go on. Um, Dave Thompson? Yeah, just to, to follow on on, on the, the market aspect of um, uh, the, the, the pilots, and, um, I mean, does anybody have the reason why a good sound reason why the market shouldn't be opened up more widely out of Orkney and out of yeah. US because it strikes me if you're going to encourage the development of the, the shooting and the marketing during the, the pilots, then you, ne you, need to, you need to allow the folk like the, the folk in US that uh, Ushton mentioned, uh, you know, who are um, creating a market, you need to allow them to develop that so they can actually and justify whatever investment they need to make in the processing. And to me, this is a perfect example of where you should have local processing in the place where these birds are shot so that the jobs and the added value stays in the islands but you need to allow them to do that. If the pilot is so restrictive in the sense that the legislation doesn't allow uh, the, mar the, the selling of it out with U.S., then that's going to hinder the, pi the pilot. You're not going to get a true scientific assessment of the effect, whereas if the market was opened up, you uh, are going to have a much better situation, I would have thought, and it will help to speed up the, the whole process. Um, so there's that point... And just how long does the likes of this pilot need to run before folk are going to be happy that they know what it's going to lead to? Is a year going to be fine, going to be plenty? So this time next year we can say, it's been a success, let's extend it. Or are folk going to look for five or ten years of the pilot? Well, indeed, um, there's only so many goose burgers you can eat, you know, if you live in the U.S. Um, so the question about markets and so on are obviously something that's uh, dear to any economist's heart. Um, Paul Walton, uh, Jim Hume, Andrew Bauer and Baz Hughes. Yeah, so um, uh, to begin with a point, point of clarification, so, so the, so the grey-like goose can be shot, you know, um, in, in the open season without a licence, but then during the closed season, during the kind of spring and summer 
you need a uh, license to do it, but that, that's not necessarily a, a problem. But I mean, I defer to Patrick and, and uh, Ouston's uh, greater connections, but one issue which actually has arisen in crofting areas that, that, that I have had discussed several times is that um, you know, if a deer causes damage on a croft, the crofter can shoot the deer. Um, if, if, a, if a goose is causing damage on a croft, it's all about who holds the sporting rights. And because the, the estates uh, get money from goose shooting in the open season, during the period when the crofters want to protect their crofts, which is the late summer, as, as the seed matures, that critical period, which is also the seed, not just of the, of, of the grain, but of the wildflowers that are so important as well in that grain, um, that they actually, uh, there has been an issue around the, uh, the, the estates being quite reluctant to actually uh, give, 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 that, give that permission. And I think that is something that is perhaps a manageable issue that the committee could, could consider because I think crofters do not feel as free as they might. I don't know if Houston has a comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, just back on the point Paul's made, it's, it's quite clear that the community-owned estates of Storas, for example, are much more proactive in terms of uh, shooting geese than the privately-owned estates. I'll leave that at that. Indeed. No, I think we understand what you're talking about. Jimmy, uh, Hume? Thanks. Yeah, that's quite, in, quite interesting. We've, we've, we've talked about um, using the, the goose, obviously, uh, as a, a shooting target, if, if you like, but, and uh, there's problems with that, obviously. You know, you, a couple of shots and they're all off and uh, they fly away. But are there other methods that can be used or are used in other parts of the world? I'm thinking of nets or, you know, fired over them to collect larger numbers at a time. Is, is there anything being done with that? Is that illegal? <laughs> uh, just to, to finish up on that. Okay, and uh, Andrew Bauer, please turn whether you can comment on that and whatever. Uh, hmm. There are, I mean, there are quite a range of different things that are done. Nets, specifically, I'm not sure others in the room may know. Um, just the point I was going to make, reflecting back on the markets, you know, some of the comments that have been made are around free for all and you know, opening things up. Think, you know, we're not proposing that at all. That's not what we're describing here. Right back at the very beginning of this session, Paul described how the grey lag population, we have less than 5% of the world's population here. And Baz said, you know, if we're not careful with the shooting of grey lags, we'll have population level decline. That's actually what we're aiming for here. That's the objective to do with the grey lags is population level decline. And so long as controls remain, we see no problem with selling into mainland markets there. It's not that this is a free for all. You're giving a bigger market, you're incentivising people, you're bringing income in. You're not suddenly throwing the floodgates open and wrecking the vast majority of a global population. You're, you're bringing down the level of a quarry species of which we hold a small proportion of the global total. So I think there is absolutely no reason why that mainland market shouldn't be available. Uh, Ustin, did you have a Just point? On the, on the point, fact. Of, point of nets, it says, you cannot use the following methods to kill or take birds, traps, snares, hooks, nets, bird lime, similar. There's a whole raft of them, but nets is one of the ones you can use. Um, hey, well, Baz and then uh, Marina. Well, Andrew's prompted me perfectly for what I was going to say, which was anything that needs to be done like this needs to be done in the with the same process as the Norwegians uh, took forward. So the way that they developed the plan, I think, as Paul has already said, was involved all stakeholders from the start. And they actually got to a situation where they came up with an agreed population, an agreed population, which is something that we've never done in this country before. My concern, though, about the, um, the demand <clears throat> is just how many birds we've actually got to offer so, for example, if you, if you do increase demand, market demand, for the Orkney birds, the, pop, the, the target there is to shoot 5,500 birds a year, I think for something like three or four years to get it down to the target population level, and then the number of birds available would be a lot less. So the, we would get to a situation where if there was a big demand, then there may not be the product there to actually provide as well. on that point, if that's all right. Um, yeah, I can understand exactly what, what you're saying there, um, but if, if the, um, the populations drop, and that's what we're looking to, to achieve with, with the grey lag here, uh, and there are then less of them available through the, 
the licensing or whatever method we want to use in terms of those that are going to come onto the market, then the value of those birds increases so that the income for those shooting a lesser amount actually stays at a reasonable level, which would encourage them to continue to shoot that reduced amount. But you've then got a quality product that is of high value, which you can add even greater value to locally by processing them locally. Um, and, and I think that could only be a good thing. Indeed, Marina. Yes, sir, um, as I say, it seems to be sort of a, a gun ho attitude. Um, it's not easy to shoot a goose. You have to be a pretty good shot. I, I don't believe there's that many people on the islands that are particularly good at uh, discharging a goose. Um, we have good examples of specialists in terms of um, control of fox uh, numbers prior to lambing. Um, as a collective, I think there's an opportunity for collaborative working in terms of meeting a, um, a market demand. That it's not just one croft or one farm that's actually benefiting, that it, as a collective, uh, surely it would be a, a better idea and um, uh, better able to uh, manage that and monitor it as well, that if things are being worked on a collective, particularly meeting a market demand, that would be much fairer all around. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? To um, ask whether more consideration could be used for alternative methods as well, you know, the question about netting um, and the question of, of using contraceptive um, in feed, you know, and that's well known in, I don't know whether it works with, with geese, but it certainly works with other, um, with control of other species. And, and I guess the, the way that that has been used is trying to interrupt breeding cycles was with egg oiling, for example, um, which I don't, um, I don't know whether it's hugely successful or not. I, I certainly know that um, geese are much cleverer than you'd expect geese to be and, and start to work out, you know, when, when their nest has been tampered with. But, you know, and so, so the idea of interrupting breeding cycles is, is good because it could achieve the objective of reducing the geese numbers. But then, as Dave keeps saying, I think if we can do it in a way that we're using this resource and, and using um, local people to, to, to manage this so that it is sustainable, makes a lot of sense, I think. Okay, Paul? I would agree with that. Just, um, just, just a couple of points. One on this, uh, on contraception. Um, now, it has been used in a couple of instances, um, but the problem we have is a technical one, which is that um, we haven't got contraceptives that are species-specific yet. And if you start chucking estrogens about in the environment, there are, can be all sorts of unintended consequences. It can be really tricky for non-target species if they somehow get access to it and, and consume it. And that has been the really big problem. That doesn't mean to say that it won't be possible in the future. And I think what I would say is that we should all encourage research on what's called immunocontraception in terms of its species-specific nature. But I think it's probably not a, a bit of a non-starter at the moment, although it has right enough been used in Venice and I've seen the effects. Um, uh, the egg oiling um, has been trialled uh, in Scotland and scientists sort of said that it's not really going to work because of the, the, these goose populations are largely dependent on the adults rather than their breeding success. Do you see what I mean? It's just the, the biology of it. However, some people on Tyree thought it was quite effective, actually. And so, 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 so there we go. So it's got kind of question marks around some of the, some, some of the um, other methods. And just the one thing I just wanted to, before it just vanishes, and, uh, and I'm sorry if this is stepping back a bit, but the, Claude, Claudia's point about mixed flocks, there are mixed flocks. And the barnacle geese on Isla mix with the threatened Greenland white-fronted goose. The current proposal says we're not going to shoot at roosts, which where the species separate out, so we're not going to disturb the roosts. They also acknowledge that the two species occur together, and we feel that one of the problems with the current proposal for Isla is that the Greenland white-fronted goose would inevitably be disturbed by massively increased shooting, and that is an issue that hasn't been addressed fully yet. Um, 
question about science here uh, from Graham Day. I'm hoping to think about the way forward in a minute or two. Okay. Thank you, Karina. I think it's something we maybe we should have touched on earlier. We've talked about the impact of these geese on the local economies and on food production, but I just wonder if there's any uh, science, any data there as to whether their presence had a, an impact on human beings, human health and animal health. Because if you think about the issue that we're encountering on farmland here where, where dogs are allowed to roam uh, wild and do their business, it just strikes me that if we've got 20,000 geese doing their business, as it were, uh, it, is there anything t to say that that's an impact on through water courses or on uh, the interaction with animals? Is there anything there that we should be concerned about? Patrick, yeah. Uh, I can only give a non-scientific answer to that, and that's that, that crofters find the fouling of pasture to be a huge problem because because the cattle need to eat the grass and, and if it's fouled, you know, if it's had, like you say, thousands of geese doing their business on it, then the cattle don't want to eat it. So it is a big problem. Andrew Bauer and uh, Baz Hughes. In addition to those health impacts um, on the cattle, there's, there's potential in, uh, Environmental risk. I think Orkney Council, in their evidence, talked about um, potential impacts on drinking water supplies in Orkney. We're also aware that there are exceedingly high levels of nitrates in and around Loch of Strathbeg in Aberdeenshire, which is a very large goose population as well. So, yes, as with any living thing, there's there's inevitable consequences there. But it's not just the animals; it's it's the wider environment as well. Okay, um, Baz. I was just going to say that we, we do know that geese do carry some bacteria that can cause, for example, food poisoning in humans, but I, I don't think there's any link being proven. So, hypothetically, that, that they, it could be an issue, but I don't think it, it, it is. Um, Houston. Years have said it's caused a problem with sheep at lambing, but uh, we've not had them uh, put that in writing. They'll say it verbally, but... Um, they won't kind of say that it's a... The other issue that, you know, that we should have mentioned earlier is that grey like have had an impact on other bird species as well, like the corn bunting. Indeed. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions to ask the Minister about when we see him, um, and therefore we have to think about the way ahead. Uh, just now, we've had quite a lot of hints from many of you about the ways that you think that we should go um, it's up to us to uh, try and, you know, treat this petition as a means to actually get uh, better solutions from the government, not just the questions about how much cash goes into it, but science and many other things. Um, do any of you have a sort of final thoughts about the way in which we proceed just now so that you can guide us in our uh, contemplation of the way ahead? Right, Andrew Bauer for... Yeah, splitting it down for the quarry species and the protected species, I think for the quarry species, given that there are, we're talking about very large numbers of a population that is not globally significant, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be care and consideration over what's done. But I think we can proceed in a more robust manner there, and certainly we would see the opening up of mainland markets for grey lag goose carcasses as being the best way to achieve that, certainly uh, in the, the short and medium term. Um, for the protected species, Isla has been at the forefront of uh, suffering the impacts, but because of that, they are so much further down the road than most other areas. Therefore, certainly what we would be keen is that this committee uh, give its wholehearted support to the Scottish Government, to SNH, to the local farmers there in the implementation of this plan, because this... If it's uh, you know if we're to have any chance anywhere else with protected species about finding a sustainable balance there, then this document and the effort that's gone into that is is the best way to to get there. If if this stalls, if we if we hang around navel gazing for another ten or fifteen years, you know, I, I don't like to think about what the consequences would be for places like Isla. It would not be good at all. Okay. Uh, Marina. On in terms of the document there for Isla, um, the adaptive management approach, I, I, I think we have to recognise one size does not fit all. There's different issues on different islands. But um, in terms of... Um, sorry. Where was that? 
uh, other species in the broader sense in terms of biodiversity, you know, where you have a population explosion in terms of geese per se, other species are going to suffer, uh, the bird species such as chuff, corn creek and corn bunting as mentioned, uh, and also the habitats as well, you know, we, we rate ourselves in terms of our species rich habitats uh, to hill ground etc. So to have a balanced approach uh, in terms of trying to redress that balance, I think that's a good start in terms of uh, the Minister's approach. Okay, um, Paul Bolton. I think um, one of the main points for us is that the, the government needs to increase its level of support for crop protection on the U.S. I think that's, that, that's a terribly important matter for biodiversity. The second point I'd make is that a, a draft strategy that is evidently incomplete in terms of fundamentals, in terms of actual the goose damage and how numbers of geese relate to that, in terms of how we relate to other members' state on the flyway of, of those species, now how they may react to how Scotland acts, in terms of the, the, the actual economics of, of the situation. These are fundamental issues that really need to be addressed before we can charge ahead with what I think is an incomplete strategy. Okay, so... Okay, um, I would have to say that, you know, I've not discussed many of the areas that are beginning to be affected in my constituency, which stretches from crofting areas in the west to uh, areas where um, Greenland uh, white fronts and all the rest of it are, you know, being conserved by the RSPB and others in uh, uh, agri uh, environment schemes, but also at Loch Eye and Easter Ross, where a lot of uh, grain farmers are beginning to complain about the levels and numbers of geese in that area. So you can understand why we need to have horses for courses, um, to mix metaphors, but we do need to require the way forward to take into account the circumstances and the species. And I think uh, we've got to a stage where most people have provided us with a whole range of information that will allow us to take this forward. This petition uh, opens a door to uh, quite a lot of opportunity for us uh, to get better schemes, to get better science and to get better support. But it's a matter of um, seeing how we can uh, lever these out of the current uh, system. But I'm hoping that in the new common agriculture policy that there will be room in uh, the rural development part of it to try and help this, as well as the basic uh, development of science, which is protected uh, in the, the Scottish Government's budget for the Scottish Rural University Colleges and so on. So thank you very much everybody for that uh, input. All of you have contributed uh, very pertinent points. Um, thank you to all the witnesses. And um, before I bring the public part of the meeting to a close uh, at its next and final meeting before the summer recess on the 25th of June, the committee will hold its final evidence session on the control of wild geese numbers uh, petition with the Minister uh, and other business. So thank you very much for coming. We're going to clear the room uh, fairly soon after a short comfort break and move into private.